Hi, this is lesson 9.1. We're dealing with parametric equations. Parametric equations mean that our x, y are going to be based upon a different variable. In this case, for example number one, they're going to be based on t. So we have this t variable that we're dealing with. A lot of times you see t or you see theta. Now what happens is that each x, y is going to be based a little bit individually upon that t value. And so you can think about time ticking off. So if we want to plot this one and sketch this uh, graph of x equal to t squared minus 5, y equal to t over 2, I need to look at this interval. So I'm going to be going from negative 3 all the way up to 2. So if I calculate each one, if I take this equation here and put it in for x, I take the negative 3 and I'm going to plug it in so 9 minus 5 would give me a 4. And then if I take the negative 2, I'm going to get 4 minus 5, which should give me negative 1, and so on. You can try some of those different ones for yourself. And that's what we finish up with. Now with the y, we're going to use this equation here. And so y is equal to t divided by 2. So this would be negative 3 halves for this first value. And then if I plug in negative 2, negative 2 over 2 would give me negative 1 and then I can get negative one half if I plug in negative one and so on. So now what we have is a starting value and so this is my starting time. And with my starting time I need to designate that on my graph. So with this I'm going to now plot this point here which is four negative three halves. That's going to be my starting time. So here's four and negative three halves would be right there. So that's where I'm going to start. Then if I plot my next point at time two, I'm sorry, negative two, that's going to be negative, ne negative one, negative one would be right here. That would be my next value and so on. So then I'm going to plot this one at time negative one, I'm going to get negative four and negative one half. And notice a lot of times we're going to end up with something that's not a function and that's what happens in this case. Keep plotting and then we'll connect them up. So here's the rest of my points. So I'm starting here and then I'm drawing here and it should be a smooth curve. And then I finish here because they do tell me that I do end at time two. So what I should do is put in direction as well. So here's my direction as I go. So that would be the graph of my parametric equation. Now if you notice, you also could uh, call this something x in terms of y. It's a sideways parabola. Might give you a few more values than just starting and stopping at these two points, but that is another way to write it, is just in terms of x and y. Example two says change the following rectangular form by eliminating the parameter. So we got to get rid of t. Then we want to graph this. To get rid of t, we got to solve for t in one of the examples. So let's solve for t in this one and then we'll plug it into the y function wherever I do see that t. So eliminating the parameter, that's the exact step. So if I square this and then I solve for t, I like it like that, and we get this. So t is equal to 1 over x and then minus 1. And I lost my squared there on the x, so still have the squared. Now I take this and I put it in that chunk wherever I see my t. So if I do this, y is equal to my new chunk, which is 1 over x squared minus 1. And then I have that down here too. It's not pretty. But it is what it is, and then I get a plus 1. So if I simplify this, these go away, and so y is equal to common denominator on the top, 1 minus x squared all over x squared all over 1 minus x squared. Hope you know what happens to those x squareds, and I'm going to get 1 minus x squared. Lastly, let's check out our domain situation. They said that we have t greater than negative one. Look at this x. Is x ever going to be zero? 
or less than zero? No, it's not. So this one would be always x is greater than zero. So we need that domain on there. How do we graph this? 1 minus x squared is a parabola open down. And so I'm going to look like this in my graph. And then I'm going to have a hole here because I start at x greater than 0. So that's eliminating the parameter. Solve for t in terms of one of the variables and then go plug it into the other equation. Usually we solve for t in terms of x and plug it into the y equation. Example 3 says eliminate the parameter to sketch the curve. Well, I like to sketch these without eliminating the parameter, but we can do it both ways. If I think about x equals cosine of theta and y equal to sine of theta, that is simply a circle with a radius of 1. If I put a 3 in here, that would be a circle with radius 3. Now, <clears throat> with this, I'm going to be stretched out on my y-axis by 3, but on my x-axis by 1. So if I do this, I'm going to have this point, this point, this point, and then this point. It is going to be centered around 0, 0, and I'm going to be like this. Now, it doesn't tell me to identify my starting point. It doesn't have a time value, so you can just end up with that. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to realize that uh, if we do want to eliminate the parameter, now I could solve for theta and plug it in, but there is a trick to this one too. A lot of times we start off with a known identity. So the known identity that we do have is sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. And so what, we're, what I'm doing right now is eliminating the parameter so we can see if my graph looks okay. So cosine squared, that is the x. So this is x squared plus, this would be 3. I'm sorry, this would be y over 3 quantity squared. And that's equal to 1. Because if I solve here for the sign, I'm going to get y over 3. So y over 3 is equal to the sign, so I just plug that in wherever I have that. So now I'm left with x squared plus y squared over 9 is equal to 1. Once again, that's the same <coughs> ellipse that we do have there. All right, so you can do it either way. How are we stretched on the x and y axis with this? And you can do that as long as you have both the cosine and the sine for each one of the x and y's um, defined. Now, when we look at these things, even though we have equations that are given in terms of a parameter, we still can find dy dx and the second derivative as well by differentiating and then dividing. Okay, you got to do it each step at a time. So, for instance, if I want to find dy dx for this, I'm going to first of all find the x dt for the cosine. So, in, I did, wrote, didn't write t there. This one here, the derivative of the cosine would be negative sine of t, and that would be dx dt. Now, I can go ahead and find dy dt from this one. dy dt is equal to... That would be 3 cosine of t. Now, how are we going to get dy dx? Well, if I just take and I divide these two, I flip them the other way around, then the dt's will cancel. So if I go dy dt divided by dx dt, that will give me dy dx. And so I just take this function right here, 3 cosine of t, and I'm going to divide it by negative sine of t. That would be my new dy dx. And we have another name for that, which would be negative 3 cotangent of t. Okay, so that's what we end up with. So that gives us our first rule that we're looking for here is that dy dx is equal to dy dt all over dx dt. So you can just divide those and that works out. Now our next step is that we want to find the second derivative. I think that first derivative is pretty straightforward. The second derivative gets a little bit fancier. But if I take the second derivative, that's going to be equal to 
take the derivative with respect to t of my dy dx. And I'm going to divide that by dx dt. That's a lot there, isn't it? Okay, now why, why does this work out? Well, first of all, if I take the derivative of this thing here, I'm going to get this d and this d. So that's my d squared of my y. This dt, this dt will cancel out, and all I'm left with is a dx in the denominator and then another dx in the denominator. So this would be my dx squared. So it does work out. Okay? That's just Leibniz notation. Now how do we put that into practice? So if I do the second derivative, that's going to be the derivative with respect to t of dy dx. Well, here's dy dx. Take the derivative of that. Well, what's the derivative of the cotangent? Well, it's going to be that opposite thing. So it's going to be negative cosecant squared of t. And then this is all divided by what is my dx dt? Well, my dx dt is negative sine of t. So there we have it. Now, on the top, I'm going to have a negative negative. Well, overall, I'm going to end up with a negative 3. And then this one in the denominator means that I have the cosecant again. So I'm going to have cosecant cubed of t. So that's my final answer. <clears throat> so for the derivative dy dx, just take the derivative of x with respect to t and y with respect to t and then divide the two. When we want to find the second derivative, then you got to go through a little bit more process, but you take the derivative with respect to t of dy dx, all divided by dx dt, and that will get you home. All right, so that's the derivative and second derivative. So ex example number five, what I encourage you to do is pause this one and see if you can go ahead and do this yourself. It's a very similar process to what we just did, but then we do have to make uh, some comments about the slope and concavity at the point two, three. So my dy dx is I put the dy over the dx. Don't reverse it, put the y over the x. So I get the 1 half and the 1 half. Those will cancel. So t over t halves. Uh, t to the 1 half would be, and I misspoke there because I still have this 1 here. So this goes to the top, and so this is going to be times square root of t. So I'm going to have t to the 3 halves. So that's my overall dy dx. So at the point 2, 3, right here, so now this dy dx, it's weird. It's in terms of t. They gave me a point x and y. So what do I got to do? Well, I got to go find out what this t is. It's not too bad. So if I take this 2 and make it equal to the square root of t, that tells me t is equal to 4. Just for fun, let's take that 3 and set it equal to y, 1 fourth t squared minus 1, bring the 1 over, I get 4 is equal to 1 fourth t squared, t squared is equal to 16, voila, t equal to 4. So regardless, t is equal to 4. So my final answer here then is going to be the slope is equal to dy dx evaluated at t equal to 4 is equal to 4 to the 3 halves, square root of 4 is 2, raised to the 3 is 8. So that would be my slope. Now let's move on to the second derivative. So second derivative, remember, is equal to, take the derivative with respect to t, a dy dx, and then put that all over dx dt. So when I do this, Derivative of dy dx, well, here's what I have right here for derivative of dy dx. So I'm going to get 3 halves, t to the 1 half, and that's all over dx dt. dx dt is 1 all over 2t to the 1 half. Then I simplify this thing, 2's will cancel, and then this t to the 1 half comes up, so I'm going to get 3t. So my concavity
at t equal to 4 would be equal to 12. So we're going to be concave up. Sorry, I wait for that writing. Because the second derivative is positive. There you go. So you can find those first derivatives, second derivatives when you're given stuff in parametric form. Okay, then example number six asks for the equation of the tangent line. What do you need when you write the equation of a tangent line? You need the slope and you need a point. Slope we get from the derivative. Oh, we need dy dx. So I'm going to let you do this one and come back and check. So I found the slope. You all should have found the slope being negative 1. Now you might say, well, what are the x and y coordinates? Well, they tell you t is equal to 1, so put it in there. So with x, my x value is going to be 0, and then my y value, if I plug in 1 into there, I'm going to get 1 plus 1, which would be 2. So there would be the equation of my line, all right? So that is another uh, process that you can do. So for arc length, this is the arc length we did before too, but it was a little bit different formula because it was just dealing with the uh, y in terms of x. Now we have x and y in terms of t. So with this one, arc length is equal to the definite integral from a to b of the square root, so it's very similar to the other one, dx dt quantity squared plus dy dt quantity squared. That all times dt. All right, so if we want to sort this out, we can, just says, using parametric equations from example six, find the arc length on the interval from one to three. So here's my equation, so all I do is find the arc length is equal to the integral from one to three, because that's my interval, and I'm going to take the square root of, well, here's my dy, dx dt, quantity squared would be 1 squared, plus here's my dy dt would be negative t to the negative 2, quantity squared, and this is all dt. Now, you should go ahead and punch this into your calculator. When you punch it, punch it in your calculator, you get 2.147. Try that and make sure you can get that. But that's pretty straightforward. Use a formula, plug and chug, there you go. All right, so this is one of our last units. We are winding down. We're in the last unit overall, 9.1. I hope you enjoyed this. Take care. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.